from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. It's inconceivable to me that we gather here today, diplomats, congressional staffers, colleagues, friends, family, not only for the 20th annual Vartanon's Day Armenian Lecture, but also for the 25th anniversary of the Republic of Armenia and of the Dadian Grant, which reinvigorated the Armenian collections and programs at the Library of Congress. None of this has been achieved by a single person. We are a library, we collaborate. The special events office, the communications office, and my colleagues both here and in the cataloging and acquisitions divisions have been here from the start. I would like to begin, however, with a person for the last, ten, uh, last decade who has been a great supporter of the Armenian programs and initiatives. She believes not only in collecting and servicing all of our country's resources, but also in presenting them to the public with events such as this lecture series. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, the Chief of the African and Middle Eastern Division. Okay, well, thank you, and thank you all for being here on behalf of everyone in the African Middle East Division. I would like to welcome you to this library and to this wonderful, beautiful hall that we call the Northeast Pavilion. I'm delighted to see you all here on this auspicious occasion when we celebrate, as Dr. Avdoyan has just mentioned, the 20th annual Vartanans Day Lecture, one of the longest series of lectures of its kind at the library with a presentation by Professor Christina Maranci, the Arthur Dadian and Ara Ostemel Professor of Armenian Art and Architectural History at Tufts University. It is only because of the hard work and dedication of Dr. Levon Avdoyan, the Armenian Georgian specialist in this division, and the generous financial support of the Arthur and Marjorie Dadian Fund that this unique lecture series at the Library of Congress was made possible and thrived for two decades. I would also like to join Dr. Avdoyan in thanking you for your presence here today, and especially to those of you who have traveled from many parts of the United States to be with us. And thank you, Ambassador Hovanisian, for having taken the time off your busy schedule to join us for today's event. Before we start, let me tell you something about our division. I always do this. This is our special commercial. But uh, so although Armenian films, photographs, music, maps, and other items can be found throughout this vast library, we hold most of the materials in the Armenian language. We keep and preserve rare manuscripts written and illustrated by Armenian scholars and artists. We serve our readers books, newspapers, and periodicals that are published in Armenia, as well as in the diaspora. And Dr. Avdoyan briefs scholars, politicians, as he did when the president of Armenia was here a year ago, uh, as well as school children and visitors from other parts of America and other parts of the world about the Armenian collections. And now, lest you think that we are the Armenian division of the Library of Congress, we do this as well for other countries for which we are responsible in the Middle East, in Africa, in Central Asia, and the Caucasus. And now, here to welcome you to the library is the deputy librarian, David Mao. David served as acting librarian of Congress until last week when a new librarian of Congress, Dr. Carla Hayden, was sworn uh, and took office, was sworn in. He's a graduate of the George Washington University and the Georgetown University Law Center and is admitted to the District of Columbia Bar, of Columbia Bar. He received a graduate degree in library science from the Catholic University of America and has practiced law for several years 
including at the prestigious international law firm of Covington and Berlin, and has held various positions uh, at the Library of Congress, including being the law librarian and the acting librarian of Congress in the position uh, in which he has acted uh, incredibly, uh, superlatively well, reorganizing many of the parts of the library within a very short time. So let me now call upon him to address you. So David Ma. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you very much, Mary Jane, for that very kind introduction. And Mr. Ambassador, we're greatly honored that you're able to join us here today. As you heard, my name is David Mao, and I am the Deputy Librarian of Congress. We do have a new 14th Librarian of Congress here, only the 14th in our 216 years of history at the Library of Congress. We're very excited. We had a wonderful swearing-in ceremony last week. Dr. Hayden could not join us here today, uh, but I do extend on her behalf a great welcome to all of you, to all of you, uh, Mr. Ambassador, to all of our friends for being here in this wonderful pavilion and really to this wonderful event, the 20th anniversary, the 20th uh, Vardenance Day lecture here at the library. As you have heard from Lee, uh, Ar Armenia collections and programs, uh, it's not some, that's not new here at the library. We've been doing it for quite some time through the generous support of many, many friends. Um, and the Vardenance Day lecture, this is the 20th lecture here at the library. And since 1994, when the first lecture was held, scholars, members of Congress, members of the diplomatic corps, uh, musicians, and even scientists have spoken all about Armenia, to celebrate Armenia. And we're just extremely delighted that we can continue this tradition here. As you can see, we are filming this lecture. All of our previous lectures are available on the library's website, and they're quite popular. I'm told that the 17th Vardenance Day lecture on DNA and the origins of the Armenian people has generated over 62,000 viewings on our website, which is fantastic. Um, I suspect that our lecture today is going to generate many more than that. I myself had the privilege of visiting Armenia in April of 2012, and as I think back, uh, visiting the Mananar Daran, uh, the, seeing the Gerhard Monastery, and getting to meet the Catholicos when I was at Etchmiatsan, I mean, there's just incredible experiences, which is why I'm extremely honored to be able to welcome all of you to this program on such a special day uh, on this, the 25th anniversary of the Republic of Armenia's Declaration of Independence. Um, if, uh, if you have not been to Armenia, I really recommend that you go. It was just an incredible experience, and I hopefully have the opportunity to go once more sometime in the future. So again, welcome to the library and enjoy the program. Thank you, uh, Mr. Mao, uh, David. Uh, I wanted to mention also that uh, David represented the Library of Congress in Yerevan in 2012, and ever since, I, at least, have considered him an honorary Armenian. And Mr. Ambassador, I think you could probably confer that honor on him. <laughs> Good. 25 years ago on this very day, Armenia proclaimed its independence from the Soviet Union. Since that time, a series of diplomats, both American and Armenian, have sought to create relationships that did not previously exist. Armenia has been well served by the ambassadors it has sent to this post, and particularly well served by His Excellency Grigor Hovanisian, who reported in January of this year. Ambassador Hovanisian has served in a variety of posts throughout the world, both for the Republic of Armenia and for the United Nations, with an extensive educational resume that includes the Haidazian University of Beirut and the Fletcher School at Taos. I hope Ambassador Hovhannisian will accept both as the uh, Armenian specialist and as um, a second generation uh, American Armenian my sincere congratulations to the Republic on achieving this milestone. And I am delighted that Ambassador Hovhannisian has agreed to say a few words on this wonderful anniversary. Mr. Ambassador. Thank you, Mr. Avdoyan. Uh, Dear Mr. Mao, Ms. Deeb, uh, dear friends, um, colleagues, 
I can't think of a better way of celebrating Armenia's independence than, than in, in this center, one of the most important centers in the world of, of knowledge, of preserving the knowledge, legacy of so many civilizations, heritage that is so dear to us, and also disseminating it. So I'm very, very happy that I have this opportunity, uh, and I couldn't obviously miss it. Armenia is, is 25 years old. I represent the, the generation of independence. I'm, I'm one of the, the people who, who went on the streets to, to, uh, to, to fight against the, the to totalitarianism, to, to venture into a totally unknown uh, territory of independence. So Armenia has been uh, independent ever since, but it was not alone. Armenia had many friends, and Armenia had uh, incredible uh, sons and daughters scattered all over the world. Some of them ended up in, in the United States, some of them, and most of them, maintained strong bonds with their home country. And Armenia was blessed to, to, to benefit and enjoy that, that attachment, that support, that also translated, became a vector for our uh, friendship with various countries, including the United States. The United States was, played a, a, a tremendous role in, in, in us becoming a self-confident, independent country despite formidable odds we've been facing all these years. And uh, in all sectors uh, of public life, in economy, but in culture. Library of Congress is no exception. For 20 consecutive years to host Armenian lectures, events, exhibits, we're so blessed, so thankful to, uh, to, to professionals, activists, volunteers. So from, from the bottom of my heart, on, on behalf of the government of Armenia, I thank you, Mr. Avdoyan, your colleagues, for your relentless activism uh, that we're, as, as I said, blessed with. with. And as, as a token of, our, of our appreciation, I want to, typically I go to places in DC with a bottle of cognac, which is the, the most known <laughs> Armenian product, but that would be sacrilege uh, in, in the Library of Congress. I got you uh, one of the newest albums we have out there. On, uh, it's called Immortals. It recaps uh, two millennia of Armenian history. It's a little naive, but it's a nice illustrated album that I want you to have here in Congress. Thank you very much. I have often said to everyone uh, who will listen that when it comes to Armenian collections development at the Library of Congress, I'm a pig. I want it all. So you can keep your cognac today, but not tomorrow. <laughs> And I will delightfully accept this book on the, on the part of our division. Now, before proceeding with the program, I would like to speak briefly about what today's 20th lecture means both to me and to our division. It is not only one of the longest lasting lecture series at the Library of Congress. It is also a testament to the success of the grant given by Mrs. Marjorie Dadian in 1991 for the quote, unquote, health and maintenance of the Armenian collections. And I'm really pleased to see in the audience one of the people who actually brokered that donation with the late Dr. Georgia Tia, the, um, our former section head of the Neary section, Dr. Christopher Murf Murphy, who was in on the deliberations. For particulars, I draw your attention to the URL the uh, internet address on the second page of your program, which will give you access to a blog I wrote on this event with pictures. Underneath that address is the URL for the Four Corners of the World blog, a recently established foray into social media by the curators of the four area studies divisions of the Library of Congress. And I urge you to subscribe because you will have excellent narratives from our curators in those four divisions on all of our rich collections. Now, Mrs. Dadian's gift was given the same year as the Arme Armenia's independence was proclaimed. I have since thought that both the collections at the Library of Congress and the Republic itself have grown together. Certainly, we have built and maintained close ties with the libraries and librarians of the Republic and have an active partnership with, at present, 14 of them. Now, in 1994, I created the Vartanants Lecture to highlight all aspects of Armenian life and culture by presenting scholars, politicians, musicians, artists, and diplomats. Many of the people who were keen supporters then are no longer with us. Dr. George Atiyah himself, 
Mrs. Dadian, who died too soon. His Excellency Harry Gilmore, first U.S. Ambassador to Armenia, James McLeod, Vartkis Balian, and just recently Father Vertinus Kalijan, whose face I can still see in the audience waiting, just bursting to ask a question after the speaker was finished. Yet I see also many of the original supporters in the audience, including my sister who comes off and I, I suspect to escape Houston. Um, and my colleagues in the library, such as Dr. Paul Kriego, who I know is here, uh, and my colleagues in AMED, whose support has literally and figuratively made this event, along with the support of, I saw Dr. Ruben Adalian of the Armenian National Institute and Aram Arkun of the Armenian uh, National Committee of America. Yet the program rests on the shoulders of the presenters through the years. Since 2000, these lectures have been webcast, and many are now available both on our homepage and on YouTube. And I'm pleased that David Mao mentioned that the uh, Peter Hrestakian and Hovan, uh, uh, Hovan Simonian's lecture on DNA and the origins of the people has garnered more than 62,000 views since it was mounted, and the number grows, as do the numbers of every lecture we presented. All of this leads me to first thank you, our supporters, to promise more programs in the future of similar import, and to introduce our speaker, not by her biography, which you will see in the program, but rather by describing how we selected her to speak. Earlier this year, I was contacted by the Journal of Ecclesiastical History to see if I would review an Armenian book. This book turned out to be titled Vigilant Powers, Three Churches of Early Medieval Armenia, written by Dr. Christina Maranci. I agreed. What I found was a book with its roots firmly implanted in traditional scholarship, detailed research, delicate analysis, and illustrative footnotes. The much maligned footnote is back, and I, I am delighted. Yet this first book in English about these churches was also set within the context of the history of the times and challenged many of the historical assumptions we have long maintained. There was also a certain symmetry in inviting Dr. Maranci to lecture as she is, as Mary Jane said, the holder of the Arthur H. Dadian chair at Tufts University, Arthur H. Dadian the husband of Marjorie, in whose name she had made her generous grants to the library. I consulted, as I always do, with uh, Mary Jane, said I would like to invite the author to the lecture. She took one look at the book and readily agreed. So at last, without further explanation, I would like to invite the Arthur H. Dadian and Ara Ostemel, Professor of Armenian Art at Tufts University, Dr. Christina Maranci to tell us about a world monument, Zvartnots, Armenia, and the wars of the seventh century. Dr. Moranti. Thank you so much, Levon, for your kind introduction. It is a great honor to give the annual Vartanants Day talk. I would also like to thank the Near East Section of the African and Middle Eastern Studies a Division of the Library of Congress for sponsoring my visit. And it's a particular privilege to offer my lecture in memory of Marjorie Dadian, whose good offices, as Levon mentioned, and those of her husband's led also to the creation of my own chair of Armenian art at Tufts University. In honor of this 25th anniversary of Armenia's independence, I wish to focus today on one of the most iconic of medieval Armenian monuments, the Church of Zvartnots. The form of Zvartnots has inspired buildings, both medieval and modern. Zvartnots can be purchased in miniature and watched in dance form. Zvartnots appears on monetary currency. And as all travelers to Armenia know, Zvartnots is the namesake of the International Airport Terminal. It has also received more scholarly attention than any other building of the 7th century Caucasus. 
So why so much attention on Zvartnots? One can offer several reasons. First, it was a patriarchal church. It was built by the Catholicos of Armenia, Nersis III, between circa 641 and 661. Second, Zvartnots, even in ruins, is a remarkable and unique looking building. For example, neither the nearby 7th century churches of Hryptsime and Gaiane, you see them on the screen, prepare one for the unprecedented plan of Zvartnots, which combines a circle and a tetraconch. Third, there is the intriguing problem of its original elevation. Zvartnots collapsed in the early 11th century, and many scholars have proposed hypothetical reconstructions, of which that of Toros Toromanyan, which you see on the screen, has gained particular favor. Quite aside from questions of its plausibility, Toromanyan's vision of the church, with its three successive and symmetrical tiers, has achieved the status of an icon. The beauty of this graphic image and the brilliance of its solution forms as much a part of the mystique of Zvartnots as the ruins themselves. And it's no wonder that a portrait of Toromanyan appears at the west entrance of the church. Zvartnots is one of the three foci of my book on seventh century architecture entitled Vigilant Powers. And in it, I wanted to step away from the traditional methodologies of Armenian architectural history. Until very recently, work in the field has focused on the physical aspect of buildings, their structure and form, on the documenting, describing, and categorizing of plans and elevations and decorative motifs, and mapping developments from century to century and monument to monument. While this type of approach is extremely valuable, and I couldn't have done my more interpretive work without it, it easily gives the impression of a sedate evolution of building isolated from the rest of the world. But my study of Zvartnots suggests the very opposite that Armenian architecture of the seventh century, when studied closely, responded to and played a role within the dramatic moment in which it was created. And that while scholars have been frustrated in their attempts to find a precise prototype for Zvartnots, it finds satisfying parallels in the realm of history and geography writing. And in another iconic monument, produced only three decades after Zvartnots, the Dome of the Rock. First, some background. In the 640s, Armenia was divided between the Byzantine Empire and the Sasanians, but was de facto ruled by local Armenian princely families. By the 660s, the Sasanian and Persian Empire had collapsed and power in the Eastern Mediterranean and the Near East had shifted from the Byzantines to the Arabs. The construction of Zvartnots between 640 and 660 thus took place at a critical transition in history, which for many scholars marks the dividing line between late antiquity and the Middle Ages. A seventh century Armenian text, the history attributed to Sibios, gives us precious insight into this uh, moment from a local eyewitness perspective. This text is valued by historians of Armenia, Byzantium, and early Islam for its detailed and reliable testimony and its consideration of Armenian affairs within a much broader context. And it's particularly useful for the information it gives regarding the patron of Zvartnots, the patriarch Nerses, often called the builder, or Shinur. We learn from Sibios of Nerses's associations with the Byzantine Empire and Byzantine imperial interests. In his earlier life, we are told, Nerses studied their language, Greek, and literature, and traveled through their lands in a military capacity. The history also recounts how Nerses accepted the Chalcedonian form of Christianity adhered to by the Byzantines. Chalcedonianism, called so for the location of the church council in 451, professed that Christ's two separate and human, separate human and divine natures subsisted in Christ as a unity. This creed was officially rejected by Armenians in 506, 
who instead held that the distinct humanity, humanity and divinity of Christ resided as one nature, miaphysite, in the incarnate logos. This is, may seem like a rather subtle point, but was incredibly um, important at the time and created a major schism between the Armenian and Byzantine churches. And Narcissus' Chalcedonian Christianity thus placed him in opposition to the traditional Armenian church, but gained, gained him favor with the Byzantines. And the Byzantines, through the 640s and 660, uh, 650s, sought to consolidate power in Armenia through both military campa campaigns and also doctrinal pressures to get the Armenians to convert to Chalcedonianism. And in the 640s, the Byzantine emperor Constans even sought to enforce this union by forcing a communion, a Chalcedonian Eucharistic service in Armenia. And on his second visit, um, he, when he did this, uh, apparently Nerses participated in the Byzantine liturgy and tried to force his fellow clergy to do the same. Some took part, others didn't, um, and maybe because of the latter who were outraged at Nerses' betrayal of traditional Armenian Christianity, uh, Nerses went into exile in Tyke, in northern, um, in what is now northeastern Turkey, but was part of historical Armenia. Um, and from there, he went to Constantinople. So, this, so the history of Sibios gives us a tremendous amount of detailed information about Nerses. So between the emperor and the local clergy, the local Armenian clergy, Nerses was faced with two powerful constituencies. And the foundation of Zvartnots must be interpreted in connection with their competing interests. Sibios tells us that the church is dedicated to the vigilant powers, from where my book gets its name, in Armenian, in Armenian Zvartnotsen. And these powers appeared in a vision to the Armenian Saint Gregory, who was responsible for, for converting Armenia to Christianity. In his vision, Gregory saw the vigilant powers as a host of heavenly angels, Basmutun Yarknavor Zoradzin. This is a very striking dedication to the host of heavenly angels and finds no precedent and invites one to ask why dedicate a church to a host of angels instead of, let's say, to St. Gregory himself. Here we note that the name Zvartnots is a punning allusion to Gregory's own name, because in Greek, Grigorikos means vigilant or watchful. Since Nerses knew Greek, it is entirely possible that this linguistic play was intended. And as for the host of heavenly angels, the Armenian word that we translate um, as host is zork, which, like the Greek stratias, could hold meanings both angelic but also military. And given the climate of the seventh century eastern frontier with its standing armies, some of the most violent of the Byzantine Empire, such a desire for supernatural protection of an angelic sort would have been most appropriate. The precise location of Zvartnots is also significant. According to Sibios, Nerses located his church near the holy city of Vararshapat, today the holy see of Etchmiadzin, on a route associated with the meeting between St. Gregory and the pagan king Terdat. Why, we might ask, did Nerses choose this particular location on a, on a road? He could have built it up farther or down lower on the road. And Maybe one reason is that unlike the previous Armenian Patriarch of Devin, Patriarchate of Devin, which was in Pers Armenia, in the Persian sector of Armenia, the location of Zvartnots lay farther west, closer to the Byzantine-controlled part of Armenia. But another reason concerns the landscape. Zvartnots lies almost directly north of Mount Ararat, some 55 or 60 kilometers away. And looking south, to the monument, or really through it, as you can now do, one sees a perfectly centered image of the mountain. Of course, this is true for many monuments um, in the proximity of Ararat, which was the tallest mountain, is the tallest mountain in Asia Minor, but Zvartnots must have conveyed a particularly strong effect of graduated ascent. Mounted on an artificial circular terrace about 38 uh, meters in diameter, 
then on a stepped platform five meters tall, and then on a second stylobate of three steps, the church rose in consecutive tiers of diminishing diameter before terminating in a drum and roof. The relationship between Zvartnots is, and Ararat is evoked not only by topography and physical form, but also by the tradition of Armenia's Christianization. The same fifth century conversion narrative containing the vision of Gregory tells how the newly Christian Armenian King Turdat, who was converted by Gregory, climbed Mount Ararat, or Masis as Armenians call it, to cut the stones for the constructions of the first churches of Armenia. So the strong visual parallel that must have obtained when Zvartnots was standing with uh, Mount Ararat in the background, um, it's hard to imagine that this was not intended. So what did Nersus do? He moved his patriarchal residence close to um, the sacred city of Vagarshapat and in close relationship with Mount Ararat, thus creating a link with both the holy city and with the holy mountain. The plan of Zvartnots is as remarkable as its setting and dedication. Its type is commonly referred to in the architectural literature as an isled tetraconch. And this is a structure of two shells, an inner and outer shell, in which the inner one is formed of four curving spaces, like a four-leaf clover. Forms of this type exist across the Mediterranean world. And in the South Caucasus too, in Armenia and Georgia, there are at least three churches of this type. But Zvartnots is the only church for which a seventh century date is firmly established. According to the archeological record, the largest group of Isle Tetraconchs dates to about 450 to 550 and is found in Syria and Mesopotamia. At Basra, Rusafa, Seleucia, Pieria, and Apamea, to name the confirmed examples, stood fifth and sixth century structures of double shell design with a central quatrefoil core and a protruding east end. These monuments are similar to Zvartnots, also in their diameter. So they're about the same um, in terms of diameter, uh, deviating only about four meters from the smallest example to the largest. So this evidence has led a lot of scholars to conclude that Zvartnots belong to a family of like monuments in southern Asia Minor. And these similarities of these buildings seems difficult to dispute. Yet. The designers of Zvartnots modified the plan of the Syrian, Mesopotamia, and Tetraconchs in significant ways. First, the shape of its perimeter wall does not reflect any of the known precedents. Zvartnots presents the first preserved and dated example of a circular exterior enclosing a tetraconch. Second, the designers of the church also made a crucial addition to the system of supports found in the earlier tetraconchs. And I had those blue circles encircle the four single columns that are adjacent to the piers of the dome. So the ones that sort of mark a square, these don't occur before. So why are they there? From a spatial perspective, they occupy a critical surface area in the ambulatory. But in agreement with virtually all the scholars to date, I want to draw your attention to the way those little columns, and let's see if I can point, actually create a, an intermediate circle. So you have, you have a, well, perimeter wall marked, right? It's a circle. And then the middle here is a, the, the intermediate circle. And then you have the smallest circle, in, circle in the middle, which is the drum. And this can be seen more clearly on like a cross section, like a hypothetical um, cross section, where you have the circle in the middle here. So this seems very different from those Syrian and Mesopotamian tetraconchs. And um, my belief is that this adaptation of the Syrian and Mesopotamian tetraconchs was generated in order to evoke the most famous round monument of Christendom, the Anastasis Rotunda in Jerusalem, to which we now turn. Constructed in the fourth century over the tomb of Christ, the Anastasis Rotunda played a central role in the spiritual life of Christians across the medieval world and was no less important to the Christian faithful in early medieval Armenia. 
While the archaeology of this building is even more complicated than Zwart Notz, scholars have proposed parallels between the two buildings, not only in their circular perimeter walls, but also their tiered construction, sculpted capitals, and even in their liturgical furniture. These visual parallels are supported by the historical moment because 7th century Armenia saw an increased interest in the Holy Land as attested in written sources. We can consider, for example, a description of the holy places by the Armenian monk Hofsep, preserved in the history of the Caucasian Albanians. Hofsep's account of the rotunda, which he visited, gives measurements and many other details not found in other medieval texts, attesting, for example, to the offset rather than central position of the tomb under the dome. And on the left, you see a plan, a new archaeological plan of the Holy Sepulchre and the Anastasis Rotunda. You see that, that central form, the tomb medicula, is not centered within the circle. Hofsep already attested to that in the seventh century. Hofsep also tells us about that there's a gallery level above the ambulatory. And also, he tells us the height of the structure and the existence of the relics within this building. So this is a tremendously important text that is neglected um, by architectural historians and archaeologists. In addition to this text, we know from contemporary sources that Armenians were aware of and concerned about the welfare of the sites and relics of the Holy Land in the wake of the sack of Jerusalem by the Persians in 614. And for these reasons, the Anastasis Rotunda would have been a um, appropriate model to reproduce in 7th century Armenia. The elevation of Zvartnots is as striking as its plan. The arcades of the first tier were composed of double colonnettes with capitals in the shape of lilies. And here you have a sort of a detail of those capitals, the lily capitals. And above those capitals were molded arcades. Between those arches in the spandrels were human figures. And because of the wedge shape of the pictorial field, the upper torso of the human figures is shown in full width, while the lower part of the body is either concealed behind the spandrel or squeezed into its narrowing space. And um, the example I just showed you shows a young man holding percussive tools with short hair and a kind of bloused garment and then um, here are two more. Um, again, they're holding building tools, which is very interesting. Above this area was a sculpted field filled with vegetal decoration. Uh, there were bunches of uh, fruit, pomegranates, and grapevines. And then finally, at the top of this first tier was a kind of latticework cornice. So taken as a whole, this is a striking composition, much more extravagant in its details and elements than any other surviving early medieval Armenian church. And scholars also notice that the specific combination and organization of the latticework, the pomegranate motifs, and the lily-shaped capitals finds a parallel in descriptions of the temple in Jerusalem, which likewise describes latticework, vantagas, lily capitals, and bronze pomegranates. So the visitor to Zvartnots may have interpreted those builders on the facade, not just as those involved with the construction of the church, but also with the builders of the temple in Jerusalem and with the renovators of the rotunda after the Persian sack. And maybe most important about those builders, they glorify the act of building itself. Excavations in the early 20th century uncovered a sundial, which is now housed in the archaeological museum and a modern reproduction is kept outside. The Zvartnots dial is important both for its particular qualities and as a representative of a robust but neglected corpus of medieval sundials in Armenia. And it should be said that medieval dials are not common in the Byzantine world, um, although they are known from places like the British Isles. 
So by contrast, over 30 examples from medieval Armenia alone have been published thus far, but this number is just a fraction of the total surviving. So whenever you go to Armenia, um, go to the south facade of the church and, and snap a picture. If you can find a sundial, you may very well take a picture. They're trying to collect these dials. The sundial of Zvartnots is the earliest dated example from Armenia. All the evidence suggests that it formed part of the original 7th century complex, and it is also one of the few ancient dials accompanied by a motto. The text reads in English, the faithful shall pray to the Lord in a fit time. Most appropriate for an instrument that by its position on the church must have served to regulate liturgical time and indicate the appropriate hour for services. This object finds a companion in another neglected dial in, discovered by Robert Edwards in 1983 at the fortress of Oltu in Taik. It features Armenian numerals and a fragmentary Greek inscription reading Narsas, Bishop. Given this name, the bilingual uh, Greek and Armenian inscriptions the tradition that places Nersas in Tyke during his period of exile and his well-known interest in architectural patronage, it is most likely that this dial is his and belongs to a now lost 7th century church in Oltu. And if this is the case, we can thank sundials for mapping his movements. The program of sculpture continues on the inside. The capitals of the Exedre are large and finely carved, with thick bulging baskets and spiral volutes form, framing a medallion. These feature two different cross monograms. One reads Narsu of Nerses, and the other reads Catholicu of the Catholicos. Note here that as with the, the old two sundial, Nerses uses Greek. He also uses it on a foundation inscription for Zavartnots, which simply reads Narsus made, remember, and it's possible to view this use of Greek at a time when Armenian had become the standard writing language as further evidence of Nerses's relation with the Byzantine Empire. The same can be said about the use of Greek monogrammed capitals. Monograms, otherwise unattested in early medieval Armenian architecture, appear frequently on 6th century Byzantine monuments, particularly in Constantinople. They are situated within grand and impressive buildings, like the, the Church of St. Sergius and Bacchus, and at the Hagia Sophia, which you see here. And they appear in the corner exedre of the buildings, in these curved spaces, just like what we see at Zvartnots. So in light of Nerses's background, it's possible that he knew these famous monuments of Constantinople and sought to emulate them in his own. On each side of the exedre, four magnificent eagles, approximately one meter in height, stood atop the single columns in front of the dome piers. Two preserved eagles turn left, the other two turn right, inviting us to think about them facing each other across the curvature of the, their, the exedre. Their impressive size and repetition invites us to ask what they meant to a contemporary viewer. Bird watchers know best their magnificence and fierceness. And these connotations also pervaded the ancient and late antique world, where eagles assumed multiple and surely entangled connotations of divinity, sovereignty, and victory in battle and the hunt. In biblical, Armenian, and Syriac textual traditions, eagles were not only the symbol of the evangelist John, but also symbols of God. In the vision of St. Gregory, God appears in the likeness of a fleet-winged eagle, reminding one of the extended wings of the eagles at Zvartnots, whose upward curved feathers seem poised for flight. In the Armenian tradition, eagles also had military connotations. The simile of the swooping eagle, Choyanal Artsvi, is found with great frequency in the sources. And in the official art of Byzantium, eagles embodied worldly authority and military power. Byzantine lead seals, and you see an example below, provide a particularly compelling comparison to Zvartnots, 
because their iconography includes both cross monograms and eagles. And it suggests that this uh, seal iconography might have been deliberately appropriated, particularly because seals move easily and their impressions are distributed widely. Finally, eagles were figures of the apocalypse. The Armenian history of Sibios records a prophecy based on the book of Daniel, describing the four great empires of the world. The first, the Byzantines, are represented by a lion with eagle's wings. These wings, we are told, would be plucked when the last great empire, the Arabs, came to exterminate all who came before. The massive outstretched wings of the eagles of Zvartnots may thus have evoked not only the magnificence of empire, but also called to mind the final days of the world. Before leaving our survey of Zvartnots, we need to make note of, for, for, of what for me is its most curious element, the Urartian stele. Discovered in 1900 during the excavations, it bears a text of 47 lines in Urartian cuneiform identifying the 7th century BC King Rusas II and his building and irrigation works. The original location of this stele is uncertain, but accounts of its discovery make clear that it was discovered not below the level of the church, but rather within its medieval context. The reports do not mention any evidence for Urartian constructions at Zvartnots, which might otherwise explain the presence of the stele. And it bears noting that the stone sockle or base into which the stele was inserted was never found, despite repeated searches. All of this invites us to think about the possibility that the stele was transported to the site from its original location, whether near or far, and deliberately reused during the building campaign of Nersus III. And indeed, the first archaeologists of Zavartnots assumed that it formed part of the church portal. Such reuse of building materials is not unusual. It was widely practiced in the late antique and early medieval churches in Byzantium. But while those churches use classical spolia, um, and those churches, the use of classical spolia has been carefully studied, much less attention has been given to the reuse of um, building materials in an Armenian context. In Armenia, recycled materials derive from a much more remote past. And they are separated millennia by a millennium from their new contexts. So we want to ask again, why did this reuse occur? It seems very unlikely that it had to do with building materials, given that we're talking about an area where uh, stone was, is, was and is abundant. So I offer an extended explanation in my book, um, because the early medieval Armenian texts offer a remarkable discussion of cuneiform inscriptions, attributing them to the Assyrians, uh, like the Queen Shamiram, or to imperially appointed Armenian governors and prefects. And taking such a medieval understanding of the Urartian past into account, we can imagine that cuneiform, with its visual message of antiquity and authority, would have served a useful purpose for Nerses, whose church and residence could not boast, like the Holy See of Etchmiadzin, a fourth century foundation tradition, and whose own status as patriarch was contested by the local elites and clergy. And here's just another example of a very interesting Urartian stele that was recarved with a cross in the Middle Ages. So far, you should have a sense of the tremendous richness of Zvartnot and its connections to a great range of traditions and individual monuments. In its dedication and location, its ground plan, inscriptions, sculpture, Zvartnot can be linked to Byzantium, to the Holy Land, to Syria, Mesopotamia, and to local Armenian forms and conventions. The complexity of this monument and the diversity of its features has frustrated attempts to assign it to a single art historical category. And arguments regarding the origins of Zvartnots are divergent and sometimes contradictory. Scholars view it as a copy of the Anastasis Rotunda, as one of a family of buildings in Syria, as an evocation of monuments in Constantinople, 
or as a purely Armenian phenomenon. All of these arguments tend to focus on one or another aspect of the monument rather than treating it as a whole. Um, and, and another way it's discussed is as a mixture. And Toramanian calls it um, a mixture or harnurt of Roman, Byzantine, Greek, and Armenian styles. So in closing, I'd like to offer my own view of the monument and suggest that in focusing strictly on the formal and physical parallels for Zvartnots, we have ignored an alternative and perhaps even more compelling body of evidence in contemporary written texts. Armenian historical and geographical writing of the seventh century shows an unprecedented interest in situating Armenia within a larger supranational sphere. The Ashkaratsuts, or geography, attributed to Ananya Shirakatsi, offers an extensive geographical description of the known world and Armenia's position within it. It's the first scientific text to have survived from early medieval Armenia, and it is also one of the earliest preserved examples of Armenian secular literature. The Anonymous Chronicle, another text from the seventh century, inserts Armenian historical notices into a broader ecclesiastical history. The first part of the text outlines world history and includes lists of Roman emperors and Sasanian kings, and also includes a set of Armenian notices and traditions. So again, Armenian traditions, like with the Ashkara Tzuitz, are inserted into a broader frame. The history of Sibios, so important to the study of Zvartnots, also in offers an instructive parallel to Zvartnots' fusion of traditions. This text offers a detailed narrative of the period leading up to the early Arab conquests, as I mentioned, and the conflicts among the Byzantine, Persian, and Islamic powers. The history places Armenia again within a broader historical tradition, considering extranational events that were not of immediate local concern. Scholars have observed over 25 years ago that the universalizing nature of these texts may have been, been motivated by the cataclysmic events of the seventh century. The Persian capture of Jerusalem in 614, the faltering of the Byzantine Empire, the demise of the Sasanian dynasty, and ultimately the arrival of the Arabs, all, and I quote here a scholar, required the expansion in both time and space of the traditional framework of Armenian national historiography. It was no longer possible to be limited to purely local history. National Armenian historiography necessarily opened itself to the universal. This is talking about the seventh century. And as an art historian, I think this trend obtains beyond the realm of texts. In situating Armenia within a universal frame, whether in geographic, chronographic, or historical, cosmic terms, seventh century writing finds a powerful parallel in the churches of Zvartnots. The evidence we have considered does not suggest a monument out of place in a local context. On the contrary, it reveals one in which local traditions were integrated within a broadly recognizable set of forms and practices. Like contemporary texts, Zvartnots locates Armenian tradition within a much broader geographical sweep. The written evidence thus allows us to acknowledge rather than ignore or explain away the fusion of traditions at Zvartnots and to interpret this fusion as a deliberate attempt to mount a local shrine on the world stage. In this sense, the study of Zvartnots demonstrates the limitations of an exclusively visual analysis. At the same time, it shows the degree to which material culture and architectural culture formed part of the larger thought world of the seventh century frontier. All of this brings me to the Dome of the Rock, known to Muslims as Al-Haram Al-Sharif, or the Noble Sanctuary. Located in Jerusalem on the Temple Mount, the Dome of the Rock was completed in 691 to 2 under the Marwanid Caliph Abd al-Malik. Like Zvartnots, it draws its conspicuous plan from Byzantine building practices, most likely in Syria and the Holy Land. 
Both Zwartnots and the Dome of the Rock are centralized, aisled, and domed. Both of them are distinguished by their elevated position. The situation of the Dome of the Rock on the Temple Mount recalls the unusually tall polygonal platform of Zwartnots. And both the Christian and the Islamic building rise in a series of successive tiers. The exterior of the Dome of the Rock, particularly before the Safavid era renovation with colored tiles, would have also recalled Zwartnots. The lowest level or dado, and you see, um, you see drawings on the right of a French archaeologist, uh, Clermont Gano. The lowest level or dado supported a course of shallow bays divided by pilasters and arcades. And above this was the parapet with its original decoration of small arches divided by double colonnettes. This parapet evokes the art knots because surviving fragments at the church indicate that the in existence of an upper level of arcading. The interior mosaics and tie beams of the Dome of the Rock present rich vegetal forms that include open lily-like flowers, grapevines, and pomegranates. And in both churches, remarkably, and I'm not the one to say this, Lawrence Neese said it at the University of Delaware, both churches use eagle capitals. At the Dome of the Rock, these capitals are partially effaced, um, but they are in many cases still discernible and form an interesting point of correspondence with the eagle capitals on the four dome piers of Zwartnots. Now, in outlining these correspondences, I am not claiming that Zwartnots is a prototype for the Dome of the Rock, so let's just get that out there. <laughs> I'm much less interested in exploring the possible seriality of the relationship than in placing these two monuments in dialogue with each other. The physical evidence suggests ways in which their resemblance may be linked to common sources of inspiration, most of all the Anastasis Rotunda and the Temple Mount. If Zwartnots may be understood to evoke these two holy sites in many different ways, the features it shares with the Dome of the Rock may also be linked to common sources and similar strategies of emulation. It's also intriguing to reflect on the possible reasons behind these strategies. The patrons of both buildings rose to power in atmospheres of contestation, and both the Dome of the Rock and Zwartnots may be seen as articulations of legitimate and sacred authority. The assertion, the assertion of this authority in both the caliphal and patriarchal commissions resulted in powerful geometric forms in the consolidation of older traditions, both imperial and sacred, and most of all in dramatic marks on the landscape. Each building constitutes an architectural focal statement, a visual magnet drawing attention to itself. And if I'm correct, in viewing Zwartnots as an attempt to mount the world stage of the latter seventh century, both monuments can be understood in relation to the dynamic changes brought about by contemporary conflicts, and more specifically, the ascendance of Arab control. So just to conclude, produced by separate religious, ethnic, and political communities, Zwartnots and the Dome of the Rock are most often discussed separately. Yet they stand as remarkable and complementary expressions of their age and of the potential for monuments to respond and give shape to a dynamic moment in history. And for these reasons, Zwartnots serves not only as a symbol of the modern nation of Armenia, but also as a world monument. Thank you very much. I think you now see why I thought that Dr. Moranzi would be the perfect. Thank you, Mr. Ambassador. I, uh, he's called away for um, meetings. We certainly appreciate his presence. At all events, I want to tell you that Dr. Moranzi's book is not only about Zwartnots, it's also about two other seventh century churches, Meren, which is in sad shape, and uh, Dr. Moranzi has called for uh, universal help in, in guaranteeing its survival, and the Church of Patochni. It was published by Brepols. I am not supposed to be a commercial up here, but if you're interested in her lecture, you would be interested in her superb book. Thank you, Christina. It was a truly wonderful food for thought, and speaking of food for thought, 
I now invite you to um, a marvelous lunch that uh, the Lebanese uh, uh, Taverna has provided for us. And I look forward to seeing each and every one of you at the next Vartanon Stay Lecture. Thank you. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.